notification, you'll never ever get in trouble. But this is pretty significant pointing. But if it's not harming the child, and I guarantee you that, and in, in, I'll just say in this case, if this had, if this kid presented in an ER anywhere, and people actually call CPS and care's kind of involved, it would be this guy named Dr. Cox. He's really good. He would have a long chat with these parents about their health practices. However, he also was very aware of the legalities of this and what can be prosecuted or not. Okay, and let's not get into this too much. Just know that I would call CPS on this, but just know that coining and cuffing are things that happen. You know, wherever you guys go, I know some things about Idaho and especially Boise, but you know, you might go someplace in America and deal with this. Foreign countries, you got a whole other shit storm of things to deal with. You had a question, Nicole? I just. How is that not hurting them? Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Well, um, that is a gray area. Um, well, okay, let, let me just say this. How is it not hurting them? The, my, my honest answer to that is, that's a really good question. However, with, when, when, you, when you ask whether it's hurting a child, let, let, let me, let me uh, take, I, we can talk about pointing, but let me just go to spanking, okay? Most people don't spank anymore. Most, most uh, studies show that spanking is very negative for kids. However, spanking occurs, and if so a child is spanked by their parent, that doesn't necessarily warrant a call CPS unless it's extreme with some <coughs> symptoms, okay? But that, that's a kind of a degree of that. But spanking is not illegal. But then here's the question. Does spanking hurt the child? So here's my point is, maybe this will heal. Maybe the physical pain wasn't that bad to where maybe that that's part of the ritual of getting the evil spirit of whatever's whatever GI or constipation or whatever's going on with the kid hence the what I would negatively term the witch doctor came in and coined the hell out of the kid so let's say that we accept that practice and we don't call CBS or CBS call and they do an investigation is not prosecutable that's a really gray area as far as the damage being done to the kid as far as their development as far as, far as what they're accepting of pain and who's administering the pain like parents physically hurting a child, there's a lot of, there's a whole shit ton of literature showing that when parents physically do things to their kids, it really is damaging them. But is it illegal? All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. I got a long rant queued up at the end. I'm gonna wrap it up with a good one. But that's kind of what you're, so that's your question, and I wish I could say, how is it not hurting them? The answer is, oh, it's hurting them. However, it's about what's legal. And that's, I could go on for a whole, all, I could talk to you guys all weekend about this stuff, but I want you guys to, I want to reassure you guys that all you need to do is pass your boards next January. So all you need to know is, should I call CPS, yes or no? On this case, you're not going to get an NCLEX question with a picture like this and have that pose. You know, I'm not going to try to put pictures in our test next week, but I want you guys to be aware of coining and cupping as far, and, and maybe some, just know that there are cultural practices that are still allowed by the law. But that's when you, you know getting in touch with your personal biases and still being able to work with a family. That's a that's a tough one. I'm not. I don't have an easy answer for you guys. But I don't want you to say I hate peds. I hate pediatric nursing because of this issue. Don't don't do that. Oh, that you also reminded me of something I forgot. But I'll try to bring it in a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> cupping, same thing. Only now we're we're sucking stuff out. Okay. There's this kind of ritualistic little bit, and you get the pattern. But just remember, there's an obvious explanation for this. Okay. Whether it's hurting the child, I just talked about that. But as far as is it illegal or not, this is not going to get prosecuted. But I, again, if you saw a kid coming in like this, and especially the kid said, ow, it hurts, or I hate this, or anything negative, there, again, I'll say it again. I'll say this for like the 50th time. There's no harm in calling CPS if this is the first time encounter that you have with this kid, all right? You guys will never, as nurses, you'll never, ever get in trouble for calling CPS. And if your supervisor, your boss, says you're in trouble for calling CPS, then please just have them call me and I'll, I'll use my PhD to <laughs> be scared. Okay, so bite marks. That's not good. Remember on my rant about dog bites and especially cat bites, especially cat bites. That's bad. But the, the big thing to remember about, bi okay, about bite marks, okay, obviously if we talk about animal control, if a cat, you know, cats don't get caught you know, usually animal control, they just cause cat scratch and um, maybe sometimes rabies and they also cause other things. But dogs, dogs are actually very dangerous. If there's a dog bite, we still, now remember, you don't have to call CPS, but animal control, remember the whole thing? If a dog bites you, or if you have a, a child who's a victim of a dog bite, you really should be calling animal control, except when it's a human bite, we don't have to call animal control, even though humans are technically animals. 
But when there's an even bite, the oh answer on the, the test question is, should you call CPS if there's a human bite? The answer will be, it depends. And it really depends on who did the biting. So what do you guys, how do you guys think we know who did the biting, okay? If it's, an, if it's an adult biting a kid, there is no question that you are lifting that phone and calling up CPS. Adults should never, ever bite a kid, or at least not leave bite marks. Grandparents do silly things. But if they're leaving marks that are adult size, you'd see the ruler, you're totally calling CPS. Please, please do that. Now, if you got other kids at the daycare, this happens all the time. It shouldn't though, but it does. Yeah, no, I've never if had kids, to do that. Well, okay, now, now if, if there are parents in here whose kid you did the biting, you. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna pick on you and say, hey, there's an issue here. <laughs> kids bite other kids occasionally, but when they're doing this stuff, this is a very graphic picture here. You guys see, there's like 15 bites here. Is that like a sibling Something, biting? Again, there? there's a bunch of things that are gonna occur, and you guys can read all about it or learn about it depending on where you're at and what kind of CPS services you have. All you need to know for the test is, I'm totally calling CPS if there's significant bites going on. But here's the thing that's always gonna happen in reality is, it's gonna be significant and your kid is not the only one getting bit. That's mm -hmm. the big thing. It's multiple kids, multiple complaints from various parents. That's what's gonna require that. So this is, if you're the nurse and you're seeing this, obviously you're, you know, again, we dealing with what's going on here. Make sure this kid's okay. We're probably gonna be prescribing topical antibiotics here. Um, maybe doing additional uh, work to see if there's any other injuries somewhere. But it all, again, it all depends on the history. But if it's just this other kid at the daycare keeps biting my kid, or this happened, this th I picked my kid up from daycare, and this is what I saw. You're absolutely going to call CPS. Don't go. Don't drive over to the daycare yourself. Don't bring your brand new camera and start taking pictures of all the other kids. Call CPS and let them coordinate this investigation. But this has to be investigated. If it turns out that your kid or that your patient's child is the only one. That's, gonna, that's not gonna be likely, it's gonna be other kids, and maybe this has been going on for a while. But you're the one who's gathering the evidence and you're getting CPS on board. Don't think that all the other parents are complaining so you don't have to, or you don't have to help this parent complain. Does that make sense? But you're also not the cop. The cops, the cops go investigate. Don't get in your car and do something about it unless you have a really big gun. In that case, do whatever you want. <laughs> all right, here's some other bite marks, but they're kind of tricky, but again, bite marks, see this? Yeah, these are bites, but again, it's all about the size and the context of the bite. You know, if siblings are biting each other, you just gotta deal with that. Okay, now, uh, I don't know why my animations are screwed up here. You know, I didn't talk about burns in class, you guys got another class, but just know that burns are horrible, and you guys know how we categorize burns, and so you'll be documenting your burns uh, as far as, remember, you don't, you don't use first, second, third, we do partial thickness, full thickness, and then still have a, a fourth degree. People still take fourth degree, but that's really horrible. It's not gonna be child abuse. That's gonna be like horrible things I don't talk about. So, but inflicted burns, intentionally inflicted, inflicted burns, this is a common form of child abuse, okay? So being scalded or weird things coming out of the microphone, right, the microwave, or even the sadistic branding stuff, that still happens and you gotta catch that stuff, okay? Uh, Everyone knows this, but let me just remind you guys, as far as anticipatory guidance of helping the parents you work with when they come in for well checks or you just care about them, one of the core things we're always doing is talking about the water heater. And this is a necessary child abuse, it's neglect. It is child neglect to not actually drop your, the temperature of your water heater down because we do not wanna have these insane burns that kids will get from a scalding injury. And it might not be from anything other than the water heater was still on too high and the child went in there and cranked up the hot water only in the bathtub and then got burned because it was too high. It's really important that young children live in a home where the water heater is regulated. That's a really big deal because that's gonna be neglect. Oh. But what's really sad is you get those, those things will happen, but then you have these intentional things. Now, without, I don't wanna to get too much into it, but we all have a reflexive, an, a reflexive nervous system. We react to things instantly. And unless they're significant, issues with the development, the cognitive capacity of the child, they should be able to yank their hands away or jump off of the hot thing that they touch. If they actually are submerged enough where someone sticks their hands in the boiling water, that's horrible and needs to have CPS involved, okay? But again, you guys aren't the cops. You are the well, people who report it, but this is, 
this is burned. And if, even if there's actually a good story, even if there's a totally believable story, are you going to call CPS? Yes or no? Yes. The answer yes. is yes, because how, yes, how it may not be physical happen? abuse, but it's totally <laughs> neglect if children are being injured because the caregivers are not providing a safe environment. Okay, so I can't say that enough. Even though I keep saying it's history plus the physical exam, can you change it? Oh, sorry. The, the history needs to make That's sense. It, because it. again, it's those immersion injuries. Okay, now I know this is horrible, but just hear me out here. You're not totally detectives, but you see what happened here? The child was, how were they positioned? Okay, so here's my point here. This is a history thing. The history is, let's say child reaches up and pulls the boiling pot of water on top of it. That happens sometimes, but again, we, we want to make a safe environment at home. So reaching up and pulling down something, that's horrible, but it happens. But if the burn injuries are such that it doesn't make sense, where's the burn here? Chest down through the trunk into the, into the, the legs. And you can tell that that child was literally curled up in a tighter ball than they are now because they were immersed in hot water. Even the, and the, the, the arms even give it away too. If the history here was they pulled boiling water on top of themselves, you gotta call bullshit on that. Do you guys agree? You see what I'm yes. saying? This is somebody being immersed or having somebody pouring something on them. Again, it's a mechanism that you guys can tell from your exam. This is horrible, horrible stuff, but that's how you differentiate what happened. Again, the history that you hear has to equal what you're seeing. This is like those branding things. There's got to be an explanation for this, and the only explanation is that's an iron. Okay, that's the pattern of the iron, and somebody put that on that child's face there. <clears throat> this is a cigarette burn. People do this sometimes too. You, you, they say, oh, it's a really bad mosquito bite. It's maybe a cellulite that's growing. The truth is, no, that's a cigarette burn, and it's horrible. But again, it, it, I don't want to shock you guys too much, but you got to look for things like this. This is not a common anymore because we don't have these around, but you guys, before any of you guys were born, oh, they, they had cigarette lighters in the car. There still are these kind of, there's similar things, but again, I'm not going to say you have to look for this because you, you probably won't ever see this in your career, which I think is great. However, it's the pattern that you're seeing. There's, uh, this is a, such an obvious pattern here, but that's the key is how did that burn get there? Those are obvious, okay? So now this is something that's it's maybe not abuse, but it's certainly questionable and probably worthy of a CPS call is when the poop is so so acidic, so lethal, whatever's coming out, it's because of what has gone in, okay? We don't give kids laxatives. Let me say that again. You don't give kids laxatives. But that's not necessarily a crime. But if it's causing injury, it's up to CPS and the cops to decide if it's a crime. But you gotta call because this is clearly bad care. Everybody see this? The explanation for this is, oh, you know, the history. I gave them a laxative and they just kept pooping and pooping so bad that it fried them. And it's actually the contents of the laxative as well as just the acidic nature of the GI contents frying up the, uh, the butt. And remember my little rant about diaper rash, okay? Diaper rash, this, you could call this diaper rash. It's like, this is really horrible diaper rash. Call CPS, let them decide if someone's going to be prosecuted or go to jail. Again, there's another iron burn. Okay, so remember, this is I'm not I'm almost I'm getting close to the end here, but just remember another participation question is which of the following is the most challenging type of child maltreatment? Remember, I told you it's physical, sexual, and then the, there's emotional abuse. Okay, so which is the most challenging to prosecute? Okay, I'll, you know, I, and I really I'm not really into the points here, so let me just tell you guys: if you think it's physical, you're wrong. It's, e it's actually easy to prosecute physical abuse because hopefully everybody's gathering really good evidence. But of course, you got to catch it, and that's the whole point of the last 15 minutes of what I've telling you guys. But as far as sexual abuse, it's way more difficult to prosecute that. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to. I'm going to wrap up my lecture by talking about that in a second. But here's something I want to make sure everybody knows about. And also, and, and Nicole actually reminded me of something that I forgot to include in here, and I'm sorry about that. But it's <coughs> emotional abuse. Okay. Is emotional abuse illegal and prosecutable? Yes, no. Think about that. If, if I'll, I'll make a horrible situation here. I'm just going to summarize it by saying parents belittling their kids, making them feel like losers, not providing them a stable, uh, secure environment. There's questions about whether there's going to be food on the table tonight. And it's not just because of socioeconomic conditions, although that's a factor. There's questions about whether they're going to get 
hit or not, but they don't get hit. Obviously being hit is probably physical abuse, but it's the fear, living in fear. Imagine that kid in the, in the, the video, the very first video I played about the military family, and that kid's watching violence every day. That's definitely affecting their emotions. So it's emotional abuse, I would argue. Should someone go to jail for what's happening to the child? And in, the, in an effort to make sure that we get everything done today, I want to make sure everybody understands that the answer is no. And this is horrible. It's horrible and horrible. I hate to talk about it, but emotional abuse is very significant on the development of kids, but it's virtually impossible to prosecute it. Should you call CPS? Again, for the test next week, for your NCLEX, the answer is yes, except if it's just an emotional situation that is destroying you as the caregiver when you're hearing about it and seeing it in the clinic or in the ER or in the, the hospital where you're working, wherever you're at, it's, it's not necessarily illegal. Okay, so one thing I, that, that I was reminded of, and I actually think, I don't know how many people are there, but a couple of people were there in Spokane with me when somebody did a study about this. And I apologize, I meant to create a couple PowerPoints about this. But here's an acronym. I would, I would hope you will indulge me and write this down. Everybody write down this acronym. And it stands for this. Adverse oh, Childhood God. Experience. ACE. Everybody, everybody got that? Let me say it again. Adverse Childhood Experience. It's, this is something that was... I'm going to summarize it in two minutes or less. The ACE study, the classic ACE study, late 90s, this guy named Dr. Felitti, Vincent Felitti, working for Kaiser. Kaiser is a, um, a very large, uh, it's actually nationwide, it was in California for a long time, but they're a managed care entity. The, the thing that's significant about that is massive amount of patients with massive data. Dr. Felitti ran, ran a weight loss clinic in the 90s in California, actually in San Diego, um, for many years. And here's here what happened. He, he got frustrated because a lot of people would, would come in really obese, 400, 450 pounds. What the hell? What's going on? And then you guys know, and you know, please, I'm not knocking diet and exercise, but I'm going to say diet and exercise, that'll fix everything. I have a kinesiology degree, by the way. I'm really a big fan of diet and exercise. But there are a lot of people where diet and exercise just won't work. So then you say, well, it's some kind of endocrine condition. Maybe so. But here's what happened with Dr. Felitti over years and years. People who were huge were not gaining weight despite the best efforts that science at the time had to offer. They would lose weight after a year or two, hundreds of pounds. And so many patients would gain it all back within a year or two. What the hell's going on? Here's what's going on is he started this, and basically here's what he did. hundred and I think over the course of time he actually got 160,000 uh, people to participate. But at first it was like 30,000 over the course of several years. Filled out a survey, did a lot of statistical analysis. I don't want to bore you with the details. You guys learned all about it, most of it, in Dr. Gallego's class. But it came down to, after looking at all these survey questions administered over many years to many, many, many patients who were having obesity problems, and obviously with obesity, there's a whole bunch of other problems, was able to link 10. Okay, that's, this is what I want you guys to know about. A stands for Adverse Childhood Event, and there are 10, another magic number, 10 identified factors or events that are significant in children's lives that will absolutely become a factor later on. And so when, and I, was, I wasn't gonna, I, I, I didn't think I had time, and I was right, I, I wouldn't have time. I was going to have everybody take the ACE questionnaire, and basically you fill out, you you look at, you answer ten questions, and you get a score of either one or zero for each question. So you can have an ACE score of zero, all the way up to ten. If you have an ACE score of zero, then you haven't had an, a, a significant adverse childhood event, or at least you're not willing to write that down on an anonymous survey, which is a real factor. But if you have an ACE score of three or four, there are significant evidence-based correlations with the likelihood of having health problems, especially obesity, but I think now we're up to, I think we're up to 38 specific health conditions, heart disease, uh, diabetes, um, depression big time, and obesity, but I could go on and on. <coughs> Being, you know, substance abuse, uh, dysfunctional relationships, going to jail, the list goes on and on. But I want everybody to know that there are actual events in childhood that are correlated with your ACE score 
if your A score is up there at seven or eight, there's probably some significant issues going on. And I guarantee, I, I'm very confident when I say the vast majority of, of men out there who are abusing women, and maybe women who are abusing men, I don't know much about that, but men who are abusing women, there's no way that those guys don't have A scores of zero. Those guys have A scores of, that are much higher. So if you really care about kids, we'll do everything we can to prevent the ACEs from happening. I'm not gonna get into it too much because it's not gonna be on the test, it won't be on your NCLEX. For whatever reason, even though the first study came out in 1999, this is only just now starting to get a little bit of leverage in the healthcare world. It's fascinating to me how this has been ignored for so long. But ACE score, scores, the ACE study, Dr. Felitti, if you guys care about this, Google it and look at it, and you'll learn so much about how childhood experiences significantly affect the health, the physiological and mental health, especially physiological, but mental, obviously mental as well, of adult patients. And I'll just wrap this up. Well, two things I want to say. One is they're all significant events, except for whatever reason, one of those events, and this is, Dr. Felitti gets shit about this all the time. I've actually heard him speak, and I've met him a couple times. He gets shit about this. One of the factors is parents were divorced. If your child and your parents experience a divorce, that actually gives you a one point out of 10. And that, that, that's hard to grapple with because many times families become more functional if there's a divorce. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about here, but if people stay together for the sake of the children and they continue to have a horrible, violent relationship, maybe that's not so good. Hence, he always gets shit at every conference I've been at. Somebody always says, what the hell is it with your divorce question? But that's really based on huge studies of, you know, up, he's up to hundreds of thousands of people. So divorce is one, but you can imagine you know, being hungry, being fearful, getting abused, sexual abuse, uh, all sorts of stuff. It's not just about physical uh, or child maltreatment, it's other factors too. But read more about the ACE studies and you'll see that it's a big deal. The other thing I wanted to mention about the ACE study was, <coughs> I can't remember. I'll think of it after you guys leave. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to something more fun, it's child sex abuse. Okay, so here's, I don't want to rant too much about it. I'm just going to briefly touch on it because I want you guys to do, I want you guys to just know certain things. Here's a little breakdown. I actually left out the slide of the, the amount of physical abuse from this two, 2010 data that I had. Uh, there's about 1,500 reported cases of child abuse in Idaho. So CPS gets a call about 1,500 times a year, probably a little more now, um, for physical abuse, okay? But as far as the number of, of people uh, being uh, victims who are reporting sexual abuse, there's actually a whole lot of referrals. But as far as people being screened in as victims, these are kids who are victims of abuse. Remember I said about 1,500 a year? But of these who are actually identified as victims of sexual abuse, 87. So what I'm saying here is this is probably the best study that I know about. It's old, 2010, it's really old. But it's based on this NCAN, the long story what that is. But in, in Idaho, in 2010, 87 kids were identified as being actual victims of child sex abuse. Everybody hear me say that? So here's something I, I feel the need to mention is, even though I'm saying that that's an actual number that you should know, I'm not gonna ask you this on a test, but something to know about, I also feel the need to remind you guys of the fact that there is no way in hell that that's the number of kids who were sexually abused in Idaho in 2010. Why do you guys think I'm saying that? Way low. It's way, way low, okay? And here's the point about child sex abuse. Even though we have the Sandusky case, even though we've got, you know, I can recite all sorts of major sex abuse cases that have come out, both adults and kids. You know, what if I said Harvey, Harvey Weinstein? You guys know about that, right? He's like a pariah in the world. And, you know, he's, I'm sorry, you know, he, he hasn't been accused of molesting minors. Kevin Spacey actually technically got accused of that. I don't know much about the details of the minor component, but someone under 17 being sexually abused, it doesn't matter about consent, it's about being a victim of sexual abuse, okay? It's horrible and nasty. But here's, there's a few key components I want everybody to understand. I'm gonna try to be, make my point with a couple videos here, if I can do it right. So I take this off, and then I click on this. I may not play the whole thing in the interest of time. During the cross-examination, victim six is asked about being in the shower with Jerry Sandusky. Mr. Amendola asked him, in the shower, did Mr. Sandusky ever touch any of your private sexual areas? Victim six replied, not that I can recall, 
other than a bear hug. I remember my head being right next to his chest there, and it was grossing me out. <laughs> Amendola, wasn't he kind of joking around, playing around in the shower? Victor Six, yes. It was kind of a cat and mouse kind of thing before he put the soap on me. Amendola, did he have an erection? Victim six, I tried my very best not to look down. I do not know if he had an erection. Amendola, after the shower, who dried you off? Victim six, I can't remember anything after he lifted me up to the shower head. Amendola continues to question victim six about that day. Amendola asks, did you think anything unusual happened that day? Victim six replied, no, it was just awkward. Amendola, when you got home, your mother was concerned? Victim six. She got upset. Amendola then asked, and she contacted Children's Services and the police? Victim six replied, yes. I didn't want to get him in trouble. I still wanted to hang out with him and go to the games. He told me he had a computer and he would invite me over and I could sit on his lap and play with the computer. And I still wanted to do that. And okay. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys know Gary Sandusky, longtime defense coordinator for uh, Penn State yeah. football team. Maybe up to 20 years of methodical abuse of uh, boys who would come to the, foot, the summer football camps year after year. A lot of stuff about how much Joe Paterno knew, other coaches knew, some you know witness statements about what occurred in the shower. That's a big thing about getting boys in the shower. Okay, so it's horrible abuse and nasty and grungy. Oh, oh, you know, I forgot that I, I was going to have a whole rant about Larry Nasser. Everybody knows, you know, Larry Nasser, the gymnastic coach, methodical abuse of kids. Okay, but here's some, here, instead of getting all of the details of it, you guys don't need to, you guys don't need to, to be informed of all the horrors of that, but the concepts behind child sexual abuse. So there, there are people who beat up kids, sometimes parents, sometimes evil people. They beat them up and they do horrible things out of anger or stress or all the factors that you guys can, you know, I'm not gonna tell you too much about, but just they're, they're there. But everybody hear these words. The pedophile, okay? Pedophilia, it's a form of child abuse and it's totally different. There's more, more and more we're starting to learn about what goes on with pedophiles. But here's something that you guys need to know Maybe for the test, in fact, at least one question on the test, but really for your careers, especially working with kids, is pedophiles, they don't do things where they're gonna get caught, okay? Pedophiles are sneaky as hell. A true pedophile is smart as shit. So, because you guys got in this program, there's probably some pedophile here. That's hard to <laughs> you can't be, you can't be needed to be a pedophile. How often do people repress their memories? Oh. Okay, that's a good question. You're talking about repression. That, that's a good question. I'm going to answer it in the next in, in 20 seconds because that's that's a perfect segue here. So, pedophiles are sneaky, and pedophiles prey on kids who are likely not to out them. Okay, the key to being a pedophile. If, if someone's a pedophile, they don't ever ever, ever get to be pedophile status in the pedophile club. They can't get to that status until they've gotten they started molesting more than one or two people. So there's horrible things going on all over the place that I can't even fathom. But pedophiles make sure that they're gonna molest people that aren't gonna say things. And there's a classic um, presentation of kids who are victims. Kids who are victims of, of pedophilia often are reticent shy, they're not part of the crowd, they have some self-esteem issues a lot, but they tend to be kids who are what I would term from, from working, you know, dealing with pedophile files for many years is potentially easy victims because they're vulnerable, okay? Vulnerable kids, and they have certain characteristics that I'm not gonna ask you about, but you guys can read more about this if you want to. But when they're identified, here's the thing that's important for you guys to remember. Pedophiles do not just go up to the park and grab them and kidnap them and steal them. Now, sadly, that does happen. Those, those, those things happen. But the vast majority of child sexual abuse doesn't occur with some random guy drives a van up to the park and snatches the kid. I'm not trying to minimize that because that's horrible. But pedophiles meet their victims and they groom them. I always use the term groom and I really shouldn't for a lot of other things that I do professionally, but grooming your victim. So pedophiles aren't gonna molest a kid the first time they meet them. Even if it's their own family, they'll groom them for months and months, years and years, and they'll create this 
this relationship. It's going to either be based on we're friends, you can trust me, I've uh, everything I do is perfect and no one else knows or cares about you as much as me, or absolute fear, which leads into what you're, you're, you're asking me about, fear of what will happen. In this case, did you hear, you, you guys saw the example from one of many victims. He was cool, he had a computer, he'd buy me stuff. Sandusky would often jet these kids around to, to trips all the time. He was molesting kids all over the country because he had access to kids. And that's the other thing about pedophiles. The true pedophiles will find ways to infiltrate and access areas of kids, like being a priest in the Catholic Church. And I'm not trying to pick on them because it could be any entity, although I, did, I pick on them for other reasons. But Boy Scouts, uh, the YMCA, come summer camp. You know, if you guys want to volunteer in summer camp, please, you're welcome to come volunteer. But don't be thinking that you're going to have to fill out a volunteer form and somewhere along the way have some pretty epic uh, training as far as identification and prevention of sexual abuse. Because it's not just a question to screen out people who might be there, but to make sure everyone's on the lookout for that. Because places where kids hang out, that's the, that's the pedophile heaven. Because they have, they, they have, it's not about being with kids, it's about infiltrating it so they're the coach or they're the, the, the team physician or whatever, they have that position of authority and they can develop a relationship over time that will eventually keep their victim from outing them. Everybody understand that? That's a big difference between physical abuse and sexual abuse is the secrets, and the secret is maintained because the kids can just put blinders on. This is what I'm saying. The kids literally don't acknowledge that. Like that kid in the shower didn't even want to look down at his penis. He didn't even know if he looked at his penis because the whole episode is blanked out because somehow in the mind of the child, they're thinking it's okay. Everybody see that? That's the horror. And then you gotta go back to the ACE study. Child sex abuse, the horror, one of the many horrors of child sex abuse is the brain gets effed up beyond, sometimes beyond repair, I hate to say that, but that sometimes the brain gets screwed up because there's a division where you can go into denial and you don't, can't even acknowledge that it happened because you can't, literally can't remember it. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if you guys got into this in your psych class, but repressed memories, or dissociation where you can't even put yourself in the context. So some, you know, when somebody's talking about what happened to you five years ago, you can't even acknowledge that that's, that that was you. But it was you because your brain suddenly split it off because the horrible trauma. This, this is this is what's what most people think happens. That it's so traumatic that your brain just escapes it, and you you're not even there mentally, even though you're there physically. Does that kind of answer your question? That's happened a lot. But again, the power of the pedophile is that the kid will not make the disclosure. And so that's my plea to you guys is the disclosure, any chance, any opportunity you have where there's even a whiff, any hint that my uncle touched me, uh, the, 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 the coach wanted, you know, wouldn't give me my pants back when we were changing the locker room, like any whiff of anything that sounds like a red flag, you have, you have to do something about it because the, the the window of opportunity to catch that, to get that disclosure is so minimal. Everybody got that? That's, that's really all I want you guys to know about that is pedophiles are evil and they're sneaky and that makes them so hard to catch. Sorry about the ad here. Okay, so now, here's the big challenge for us all. I'm not gonna play this, I promise I won't play this whole thing, just like 30 seconds. Then. There's plenty of people to pick on, but this is a, I know there's this things is a movie spotlight. You can't on our get through this. But I also know there's a story here. I think everybody will hear about it. Austin. Do you think your paper has the resources to take that on? Mid-90s. I do. Do you? The Boston priest molested kids in six different parishes over the last 30 years. The church found out about it and did nothing. We haven't heard any long-term investigative resources for the case. No, we haven't. And that's the kind of thing your team would do. Spotlight. Guys, listen. Everybody's going to be interested in this. Obviously, the church will fight us very hard. I'm trying to get some background information. I don't want you recording this in any way, shape, or form. Nothing. We understand you've settled several cases against the church. I can't discuss that. There aren't any records of any of these settlements. When you're a poor kid from a poor family, and when a priest pays attention to you, it's a big deal. How do you say no to God? So I like this is the deadline. You think you've got something? I want to keep digging. We need to focus on the institution. Show me the game from the top down. They'll try to silence anyone who speaks out. You leave me alone, you hear me, goddammit? 6% act out sexually. 6% is 
90. 90 priests. If there were 90 of these bastards, people would know. Maybe they do. Alright, well, you guys get the point there, okay? So the challenge again is when you're try when when you actually have the actual case in front, you're there and you're like, I'm concerned because I hear this closure, okay? I, the reason I'm not gonna get out into this until you guys actually do it is because don't complete, just remember this, don't do it. Don't try to be a cop or investigate it. If you get this closure, the answer is talk to people around you before you call CPS, but yes, call CPS. Because just like physical abuse, professionals have to handle this, but prosecuting sexual abuse is really tricky. And I, you know, I, if I start talking about it, I'm gonna get too much into it, but I don't want you guys to worry about that other than I just wanna plead that you got to get the disclosure because then when the disclosure is happening and people who hopefully know what they're doing start working the case, then you build up the evidence. Age of the child, what exactly happened, what can be proven in court or not, who said what, who talks to who at the right time, building up the case, and there you have it. But then, hopefully that everything will happen and hopefully that if the best thing that happened is the child doesn't get uh, sexually abused anymore. However, as the, that movie alluded to, and I'm, you know, again, I'm picking on the Catholic Church, I don't have to tell you any guys, the Catholic Church is still, still suffering horribly because of the institutionalized movement. And when I say that, I'm trying to say this. Every institution, even government itself, has, is vulnerable to having bad characters happen. The question is, how do they deal with it? Like, you know, like you guys know Starbucks right now is dealing with this perception of racism, and you know, who knows how they're dealing with it, but, there's this perception. The Catholic Church will, you know, I, it'll probably be a couple hundred years and they'll still be suffering from the institutionalization where they protected pedophiles. So that's what I'm trying to tell you guys is, you know, it's more of a society statement I'm making, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that the only way to eliminate pedophilia is obviously to, to help the kids who are may hopefully making a disclosure, but we got to get on it as far as what's accepted or not. But again, when, when, when this stuff hits the media and there's mainstream movies about it, it's actually refreshing because that makes it okay to talk about and literally that's gonna get a lot more disclosures from kids. I can tell you a long story, but the short of it is after that Sandusky case, the nurse practitioners, not the ones who are there now, but the former nurse practitioners or her cares, they suddenly had a threefold increase in the number of dis sexual disclosures they were working in Canyon County after the Sandusky case hit, actually it was after about six months later, suddenly they were busting their hump. And I, you know, we, uh, we were making these running jokes about how it seems like the pedophilia, the pedophiles of Canyon County are all working overtime lately. It's like, no, now the kids, literally kids and families are actually, it's really more families listening to kids who may say something, they're actually listening to the kids. Everybody hear my plea here? Listen to the kids. Four year olds, five, six year olds, they don't make shit up like this. They say it, they should be believed. But 30 years ago, a five year old will say that somebody put their penis here or made me touch this or that. A lot of people, maybe the majority of Idahoans would say, no, that could never be possible. That's your family member, that's a priest. That's your, your coach. They would never do that. But I'd like to think that now we're not living in that age anymore. But that's it's all about talking about it and making kids feel that it's okay to talk about it and then there's not gonna be a stigma associated with it even though the whole process is actually very horrible. Question. Um, so my experience when I have kids in Catholic school has been um, you can't even volunteer in the school as a parent without going through, they have a safe environment class that has to be done like every other year and they run a background check on you. So it's, I mean, I feel like I'm not making excuses for any stuff that's happened, but I do feel like they have addressed it in terms of not assuming, even among parents, that you're a safe person, even if you, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, I think there's been a lot of awareness raised, and obviously there's always more that can be done. <clears throat> Well, that, that's, a, that's a good point to, to, your, to Nicole's point. Please remember, you know, awareness is important. And if, if you guys are, if, I'm hoping that you're thinking, what can I do? Well, obviously what you do is be a good nurse and don't discount what you hear from one of your patients or family members. Don't discount, you know, family members of the families you're working with. Don't discount it. But at the same time, don't think that it can't happen. And I think the awareness is really helping entities, you know, any entity, in this case, Catholic Church. I, I'm sorry I pick on that, but they, it was just worldwide, uh, brutality as far as hiding it. I'd like to think that no entity would ever say, oh my gosh, here's a pedophile that we've discovered in our midst. Let's do something about it. 
I'd like to think that that would happen, but please don't kid yourself. And part of that is, and it isn't because there's hundreds of millions of pedophiles out there. I, I don't think there's that many, but pedophiles are just so smart and they're so poorly understood. I hate pedophiles, but I'm also fascinated by them because it, it may be arguably the worst thing you could do to someone. It may actually be better to kill a kid than to rape them sadistically over time when you are asserting your, your powerful source. And yeah, I didn't play that whole movie, but that Spotlight movie is a very good movie if you really under, want to understand the dynamic of victims because part of the movie talks about when you say, well, why didn't all these mostly boys come and testify back in when it was happening? I won't get into it other than you can only imagine why. Why don't kids make the disclosure? It's because they have been horribly traumatized for life and it really does affect them. And that reminds me of something I'm going to say about age studies, but it's not important for you guys to know. Let's go to grad school. It has to do with genetics and genetic damage. I'll just say this. It's one thing to have something bad happen to kids, but without getting into it, I'll just say there are now studies that are starting to show that maybe when something bad happens to you, as you reproduce, your grandkids could actually have genetic changes because of the trauma that you sustained. I, I, I don't want to get into it because it's not going to be your test, but it's like fascinating. How? But, um, well, several studies, rat studies, and then studies of uh, concentration camp survivors and people.